Crawford. <laughs> oh, yes, thank you, Richard. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming from the other branches this evening on a cold October evening. We're really pleased to welcome Ernie Warrender here, who um, is a great speaker. He's a witty speaker. He was a candidate in the Western Super Mayor back in 2015. Got, I think, the highest, one of the highest votes for UKIP in the whole of the South West. Coming second, I think, didn't you? Or third? We came third, third. Yeah. But it was about 22.5%, but it looked like that. Yeah. And five years before, still in, in, in Bath. He's a very, very, as I said, he's a very witty and engaging speaker. He started life down at one point in a squat down in London, worked, worked for Ford Swag and and brought himself all the way up to running his own business, a very substantial business um, down in Bath, I think. So, witty speaker, and you're now re uh, renovating your place up in, in Hereford. So, yeah, we've got the scars to prove it. He's got the scars to prove it. So, anyway, round of applause for everyone. Thank you very much. Skill Centre course to be a panel beater and sprayer. And off I went to Plymouth 
a formally five years apprenticeship, six months I was going to be a panel meter and sprayer. I went down to Plymouth and supplement my income. I worked on the doors in Union Street. Well, anyone who's been to Plymouth, they wouldn't know what Union Street's like. It was marvellous. The only saving grace, I was at the top of a huge flight of stairs. You'd open the door and you go, nah, and just shut the door. And go, nah. I then left Plymouth to go to Australia. Because who remembers Ovidas and Pep? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah, funny the Romaniacs didn't. We were the economic migrants, weren't we? There was nothing here in this country. Funny they chose to lecture us rather than engage with us. Well, not us, because we can't stomach them. Um, basically, I went to Australia, and I'm there for about a year. Get a knock on the door. Good day, mate, where's your work permit? <laughs> get out. But kind of get out. But luckily, they put me on a plane to... What was it? Well, I think you pronounce it Phuket, but I certainly can't. <laughs> I thought, any place that's got an airport called that, I'm in. I'm in. So eventually the money ran out. The British Embassy, back to England, to a squat in London. Fab. So I'm in this squat in London, thinking, what am I going to do with my mate Billy? And one of the jobs I'd had was as a double glazing salesman, which is an absolute <coughs> scream. I stuck it for about three months, and I promise you, anyone here watch Corrie? Yeah. You do, don't give me that. One of the stars on Corrie's, one of the blokes I work with, the, the villain, the little puddly and thug. I couldn't believe it, he's actually an artist. Um, so I said to my mate Billy, I'm going to get a job. So I went for two jobs, I went as a bus driver in Brixton. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, fair, short thrift there, and a senior sales executive for Canon. So I go down the Oxfam shop, I get an orange wool suit. The trousers are like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm at all, lad. And it's July. I am sweating my bits off. Anyway, blank the job. I went down the library. You remember that big building with books? Anyway, I went down the library, got the book out on how to be a salesman, read it through, got the job, and they gave me an Astra estate. Okay? I'd arrived. Somewhere for me and Billy to sleep in. First month we kept in the car. No, to live. And I kind of went up to the top salesman and I said, look, I've like this, I haven't got a clue, I'll do anything for you. I'll carry your machines, I'll canvas, I'll even take your wife out at night. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do. And he taught me how to do this job. And they never worked Mondays, they didn't work Fridays. I couldn't believe it. I was paid to swan around drinking tea with people in a nice new shiny car. And if I didn't like them, I'd say, well, it's lovely to meet you. Um, there's the car, it's time for a sharp exit. So I carried on working nights, like I did at Ford's, I carried on working weekends, and I became the top salesman in the UK for Canon for about four and a half years. And this will probably come as a shock to you, they got a bit fed up with me. The more successful I became, the scruffier I got, if that's possible. I ended up with a beard like this, and uh, I just thought it was, it was just a fun job. I ended up with a load of business friends, and had a great time. I left them, I set my own company up 21 years ago, and despite me, we employ about 100 people now. Um, we've become the largest British-owned company in the Southwest, and I'm banned from going to work. Great, huh? My own board of directors has banned me. They say I'm a disruptive influence. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mean. I then, how did I get to join UKIP? Well, <clears throat> I went to a conservative rah-rah meeting. A guy came round, conservative councillor, to the offices in Bath, which is where headquarters were, and he was a veep on the pilot. Really nice guy, he wasn't case Tory, but God, he said, look, you're a businessman in Bath, would you like to come to our meeting to launch the candidate for the 2010 elections, Herr Fabian von Hechter, the gay German management consultant from London, who's going to cut the mustard in Bath? I mean, is it free? He said, well, no. I said, well, right. So I went, and he said, we've got Michael Howard. Yeah, the creature of darkness, I think. I said, look, could I have a word? Do you mind? I've never met anyone famous. I've never, ever met anyone famous. DLT once nearly ran me over in London, but that's as close as I got. And he said, yeah, I'll get you to meet him. So we go to the event. He comes up to me. I said, hello, Mr. Howard. It's lovely to meet you. Um, and I've never done a political thing in my life. I couldn't care less about politics. I said, look, you've got a lot of money to find because Tony's spent a lot when you get in government. <laughs> I said, look, there's a way us British businesses will pay more tax with a big, smiling face. 
I said, just allow us to do business with our government. Give us the opportunity. Because we all know what cars the police drive, what ambulances the ambulance service drive, what motorbikes they use. I know what photocopiers they use. Who said, oh, no, 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 you're talking about protectionism. Don't be silly, no, no, love to meet you, well done, good show, you yeah, off you went. I thought, what an arse. Didn't bother my French man. <laughs> I thought, honestly, I can't believe this. So I festered on this. So I went into the meal, and I have to confess, I had about three or four glasses of flavoured water. And I was feeling pretty brave. So it gets to the end, and they said, we've got Michael Howard. Michael says a few words. Would anyone like any questions? So, oh, Mr. Howard, what will your role be in the incoming government? Mr. Howard, where's your lovely wife? And they said, right, if no one's got any more questions, and I learned at an auction, you wait till the hammer goes up. I said, oh, excuse me, excuse me, hello. Oh, yes, yes, I said, right, Tony Warrender, a local businessman, Mr. Howard, we spoke earlier on, and, and you said you couldn't give us stuff about British business. Isn't silence amongst a lot of people very quiet? I said, no, no, is that just a personal view, or is that the view of the incoming government, just interested as a British businessman who cannot do business with his government? And he started sputtering. And I thought, oh, hey, bloke's a barrister. Top bloke, top of his, and he's sputtering at me, Mr. O, 1 O level. I said, tell you what, Mr. Howard, tell you what we'll do. We'll do a quiz. You're in France, you get nicked for speeding. What car's the French policeman driving? All right, just what it is, can we move? I said, whoa, 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 whoa. It's a Peugeot, Mr. Howard. It's a Renault. It's a Citroën. All tendered for by fair EU tendering. We'll do Germany now. I said, I don't think we will actually because. I've made my point, and believe you me, you've made yours. And I sat down to a thunderous standing silence. <laughs> yeah. So I learned what it's like to, to take a knock. Two people come up to me afterwards. Chilean lady. She says, oh, excuse me. I said, yeah. I said, you don't want to be seen talking to me. She said, no, no. I'm on his table. He wants to know where you're from, why you're here, what you're up to. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm just a bloke. I'm just a businessman who is fed up with not being able to do business, not getting any opportunity to do business with his government. That's all. That's all. And he gave me the answer that has pretty much made my mind up. And a Frenchman came up. He goes, Monsieur, for what you say, I say well done. In France, no. <laughs> and off he goes. Au revoir, mate. And I went out and joined UKIP the next day. <laughs> I drove all the way down to Salisbury to sign up on the dotted line. I said, this is, if this is the quality of people trying to run our country, they could not run a party in this pub. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely unbelievable. I then, they came up to me and they said, do you fancy standing as the PPC in Bath? I said, yeah, absolutely. What is it? They said, well, for the MP. I said, yeah, well, they said, well, do it as a paper candidate, that's great. So I did it as a paper candidate, and six people turned up at my inaugural meeting, and here's a plug, William Lord Dartmouth came all the way down to give a little speech in front of seven people. Yeah. All right? He's never been stinting in the effort he has put in. You know, I got a lot of time for him. And I decided I'd go to one of the, the hustings things. I mean, I've never spoken publicly, I promise you. And I sat there in this college. I didn't say a lot. I just, I didn't, it was all right. It was okay, you know. So about a week later, they announced some the, the hustings in Bath in front of 4,000 students in Bath University. <laughs> oh, thank you, God. So I'm outside the cafe with my car, with all my little UKIP stickers on, and there's a young lady, about 22, a couple of young lads, and they stood by and I walk up and went, you're all right, how are you doing? I've got my UKIP badge on. They said, oh, it's yours, is it? I went, yeah, yeah. I'm the chair of the student union, she said. I said, oh, lovely, I'm seeing you next week up at the thing. Nazi. Excellent. Me? I said, um, a bit harsh. I said, uh, what's that mean then? Uh, fascist. You're all fascists. I said, oh. I said, actually, actually, I said, it's your lot. Because I guess you're a bit left of centre, aren't you? You know, forgive me for assuming. National Socialist Workers' Party. So let's have a look at it, shall we? Hitler, 18 million. Stalin, 20 or what? 20. Pol Pot is a good one too. Oh, Chairman Mao, your absolute hero, 60. I said, the worst you can say about me, because you're making the assumption I'm a teensy bit right of centre, 
is Sir Walter Raleigh. What? I said, fags and chips, the greatest mass murderer of all time. They have no sense of humour, are they? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so I go to the hustings. I go to the hustings, and there's a big bench, and I'm here, hanging off the end of the bench, here. And the green guy gets up, and he goes, blah, 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 blah. and you will see they've put the extremists where they belong. On the right, ah ha 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 ha. And everyone goes, ah ha 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 ha. Oh, great. So I stood up, I said, it's really funny and they're really selfish, these people. Because if they took the time to look at us through the audience's eyes, the customer's eyes, they see that I'm on the left, he's the blooming extremist. And the first question I was asked there, the first question, what is politics? And they all stood up. Don Foster, the Liberal Democrat, education, I'm going to fight tuition fees, right, have you elected me? Yeah, put them through, well done. All of them, Labour, Tory, and they all stood up and they said it's power. It's about the effective uh, power, power for the people, it's about power. And I stood up and I said, do you know what, it's unbelievable, they're power mad. I said, in this country, politics is actually derived from the Greek. Poly, many, numerous, and ticks. Blood sucking parasites. <laughs> Which I just couldn't stop myself. I just could not stop myself. And they clapped. And I thought, well, I'm gonna roll there. I said, actually, I said, actually, in my book, it's about the effective implementation of the will of the people, democracy. That's how I view it. And I'll never forget, after the event, my bit had the most people around it with students going. I don't get you, what's this all about? Because, you know, you kid there, you know, and, and I had a great time and I learned. When you're doing this, this object lesson for you as well, go where you're hated. There is no point in going and talking to people who love you because they'll all agree. Go where you're hated. And I was brought home to me, the parliamentary candidate for Glastonbury, well, Glastonbury was in his ward, refused to do the gig. <laughs> Kel Supremes. Yeah, we all know what Glastonbury is. Ficko says, I'll do it, I'll do it, fun, I'll go. So I go there, and they're all there. Tessa Munt, Poet's Delight. Tessa, God bless her. Um, James Heapy, the top work soldier. <coughs> they're all there. And, I, and it's not going too badly. I've only been called a racist and Nazi about eight times, so I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm on a roll. <laughs> and then she stands up, 74 years old, Blue and green dreadlocks, piercings, tattoos, and a full-size blow-up doll of ET. I promise you. And I thought, please don't love me. She goes, you, Mr. Ukip, this is my friend and my lover. He's an immigrant from another planet. We sleep together. He contributes to this country. What are you and your lot going to do about him? And I stood up and I looked at her and I went, throw it out. <laughs> and everybody started laughing. And from then on, they started to engage with me. They actually looked at me a little bit, and a chap came up to me at the end, and he goes, I hate you, Kim. And I said, oh, I'm really sorry about that. He said, no, I vote for you, mate. He said, I hate you, Kim. <laughs> Go and talk to the people who dislike you, because an away goal is worth two. <coughs> so I took his vote off. Oh, God knows where. I really don't know. Western, Western Supermare, we had a fat campaign. I decided that we've got nothing to lose. We were scheduled to get about 4,000 votes. And I'm very fortunate in that I've got an old 1926 banner. So I bedecked the thing with UKIP flags everywhere and phoned the BBC up and said, have you seen that lunatic driving around Western in a Bentley in a very funny accent? You ought to go and you ought to go. So I get a phone call from BBC. And they were doing the battle bus thing. Who remembers Labour's pink battle bus? Yeah. Oh, patronising oh, is, patronizing is the word you're groping for. So I get invited on the Sunday politics show. I thought, well, this is cool. That's one of this. So I go up there. Unfortunately, as my wife pointed out, I've got dirty shoes. So I hadn't had my hair cut, but I was doing my best. And they do a clip, the Labour battle bus. And uh, David Steele, anyone remember him? Yeah. What they do his party? Um, <laughs> him on his battle bus, and then me, banging around with this old banger. And it, it, I have to say it worked, because even the people who didn't like us loved coming up and chatting about the car. We had a scream. And I'm sat there in the studio, smug as ninepence, and David Garston goes, well, Ernie, 
What do you think then? How do you think the people of Western are going to react to you swanning round in a vintage Bentley when they're living in austerity? I went, you get. Um, I said, well, possibly they might think if they roll their sleeves up and get on with it, you can achieve an awful lot in this great country, David. And he went, and about the Pink Labour battle rights. <laughs> always, I said to them, the BBC have always been fair to me. And I think Richard will bear this out because you've, you've worked with them. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. They, they said to me once, they stitched me up, they said, got you a gig? I said, fab, BBC Asian Radio. I said, oh, thanks, guys, that's cool. Do you mean it? And I'm Manny Masur. And in actual fact, he was really cool, he said, because Asian Radio is predominantly kind of Commonwealth and they quite like us. You know, they like what we stand for. Where we are now, we've got this great, the leadership contest going on that we should have had three months ago, I think, yeah. it's a fair comment. I went on BBC Radio about a week and a half ago following the Stephen Wolf affair. Okay? And basically, I, I said to all the people in the UK, I said, all right, go out and say to people, hello, Mr. Person in the Street, what do you think of Stephen Wolf? And they will say, Stephen, who? It's only us, the people in the know, who are really paranoid about it. Now, a month ago, it was Labour with uh, Jeremy Corbyn, Tom Watson. Funny, isn't it? All their policies are written by Tom and Jerry. <laughs> um, last week it was us, and now this week it's the Tory party shredding themselves, not on Europe this time, surprise, surprise, on an airport runway. And isn't it interesting, as an aside, I only thought about this on the way out, Theresa May, who has presided over the biggest uncontrolled immigration this country's ever seen, yeah. wants another airport bill. That's scary, isn't it? That is so scary. I'm sure she's sincere about Brexit. <laughs> when you look at it, I have made my mind up who I wish to support, but I, I want that person to be a unifying candidate, and I think we've got great candidates. I like the things uh, Rashid said when he said, look, we're having a proper leadership election. It isn't nasty. Someone will be elected leader, and then we can all get behind them. We've all got our views in this room as to who that would be. My personal view is whomsoever it is, and I absolutely make no bones about it, purely because this guy, we would kick our fingers and he was the only person who'd come, which was Paul Nuttall. Yeah. Alright? That's who I, but I want him from day one to appoint a cabinet. Because make no bones about it, we're the opposition. Yeah. I said this on BBC Radio, you've got two choices here, you've got a party who call themselves the opposition who oppose because they're called the opposition, they have nothing constructive to say from their champagne socialist flats in Islington, yeah? You've got a party, and, and let's be honest, you know, we're all British working people and there's a little bit of patriotism in us, yeah? You know, I'm wearing this in honour of my father who served in Bomber Command and was treated like scum. And he was obnoxious too, he got thrown out of the RAF and put the Royal Australian Air Force. He was, he was that horrible. Just not what he always wanted to fight. Um, you've got a bloke who won't sing the national anthem, thinks it's funny. You've got a party that subscribes to the single biggest destroyer of the working person's wages. I'll never forget, a team of four painters and decorators came to me at Western and they said, we were on £10.30 an hour, we've been told it's minimum wage or else because they'll get some polls to do it, and they'll do it well. We were, over the same pet, we were, we were. And you've got a party that subscribes to the loss, mass loss of jobs to British people. Or, you've got a party that says, listen, four million people want a say to an old, Etonian, out-of-touch government. So that government goes, yeah, do they? Hmm, okay. So they have the referendum, they get the shock of their lives. We say to them, four million people want their kids given the opportunity for a decent education, please. We're off the scale now, by the way, in case you get... It's funny, isn't it? It's the academic intelligentsia and the public school brigade who don't like grammar schools. Is it fear? Is it fear that people from grammar schools can actually achieve something and get out, of, get out their box? And the out-of-touch government go, oh, oh, okay. Do you want an opposition that says, treat our armed forces with respect? And mm -hmm. Theresa May now says she's going to ban tank chasers. Do you want an opposition that says, give people in this country a chance to become doctors and nurses? Don't just import them. And 
coincidentally weaken that country's ability to look after its people. Yeah. 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 And by the way, um, Gary Lineker, I just heard now, he's taken in three of these children, migrant children. He wonders, can anybody send a supply of razors and shaving foam, please? Because uh, yeah. I've never seen anything so daft. Shave for the children. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you, whose act is this? Oh, <laughs> we are the genuine opposition, not that out of touch champagne socialists. I'm afraid not. They're, they've run their course because who, what, what do they actually stand for? Tony Blair, God bless his cotton socks, and loathe him or loathe him, sorry, love him or loathe him. And I really thought we'd eradicated TB from this country. <laughs> He recognised their course was run. Because if the workers get any more rights, there won't be any blooming workers. That's just a fact. And the Labour Party, he moved them to the centre, which, you know, I've, I've nothing to do with them. I believe they are absolute hypocrisy. At least the Tories, you know what they're up to, and a bit might drip off the table. Okay? Labour, they preach about workers this, workers that, it's from their, as I say, their Islington houses. That, who's that ghastly? Woman, M Emily Thornbury. Yeah, yeah multi millionaires, barrister. Lady Nugent. <laughs> Lady White <Man. laughs> And they preach to people who actually are having to earn a living, you know. No, I can't stomach them at any price, but he did at least recognise that. They're gone now. They, they will be absolutely punched on the nose, and we will take seats from them. Our traditional, uh, I suppose people thought of us as. Colonel Blimp, retired, worthy, joins UKIP, yeah? Not anymore. We have those people. We are really the only unifying party. We, the Lib Dem thing at Oxford, it's a hiccup. Oxford, Bath, these are liberal intelligentsia, university cities. They bear no relation to reality. I know that just stood in Bath. We have got a brilliant positive message now, and what you've been doing in Long Levens, out there on the ground, half the people don't know about Stephen Wolf's theatricals. They don't know about any of this stuff. They know about UKIP. They know about UKIP. And Nigel, us, have achieved more, <coughs> I think, probably than any other post war. Yeah. <laughs> I, has anyone got any questions? Because what I'll do now is I'll shut up, I'll have some flavoured yeah, water. Yeah. yeah, go on then. Well, I started from Humble Origins. Uh, I was a carpenter and joiner. Um, I got paid release in Southall Technical College. And before you, you become too overwhelmed with the idea of grammar schools, we had um, apprentices coming in from South Bucks. Uh, and there was so much emphasis put on the excellence of the grammar schools that the apprentices that came into Middlesex for a bone release had to have um, a year or 18 months um, remedial education in, in maths and uh, English language because all the resources had gone on, on, on the elitist grammar schools. So don't forget too um, wound up with one, in, how wonderful the in response to that, world. In response to that, in, was divisive. in response to that, in response to that, you have, uh, I don't disagree, you have a one size fits all badly education system. I think we could actually look to somewhere like Germany where you have uh, academic schools. There is no doubt, my other half's got degree and a master, she can't do a ruddy shoelaces up, okay? Oh, right. Yeah. right. Yeah. There is a place for people like that. You should have technology schools yeah, yeah. where people should be taught. And in yeah. Somerset, where I, I, I lived for many years, they had a wonderful state-funded school, Brymore, which gave the archetypal I can't read, I can't write, I drove a tractor. They gave them an education. They would say to them, look, if you don't do your maths, because to be a farmer, you actually need some skills now. If you don't do your maths, you won't be driving the 200 horsepower John Deere tonight. End of conversation. So, no, I don't hold the grammar school up as the elitist system because we didn't have that with the public schools, the elitist system. That was the elitist system. A balanced education across the board that identifies and allows interchangeability. You know, flexibility. There is no doubt 
that our education system is broken. The 1944 Education Act said the quality of esteem, it was never any, anything of the kind. Uh, possibly. No, possibly. It never was. Rich. Yeah. Um, I understand what you were saying uh, about support for, for Paul. Speak a bit louder, Rich. Sorry. Um, I understand what Ernie's saying about the support for Paul. To me, what, what is more important in many ways is the, the uh, philosophical direction of the party. And I, 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 I have spoken to Ernie about this before, about the um, English dimension. And I wondered if, if Ernie would elaborate on where he sees us I, as a party yes. going forward rather than just the individual at the top. That's I wrote saying. to, yeah, that's a really important, a big question too. Now, absolute classic. What, any Welshman in here? Excellent assistance. <laughs> 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 I bought a couple of companies in Wales and two and a half years ago they whooped us at rugby, yeah? <coughs> they won. So I went over there for a meeting. I said, Adam, well done. Before we took the meeting, you beat us, you won, shut up. All right? I said, by the way, Adam, what are you? And he literally went like this. He went, I am Welsh. I went, you're all right, calm down. And in their warehouse, they've got a whacking great Welsh flag. That's cool. You imagine in my bath warehouse if we had the flag of St. George hanging outside. What is our blooming problem? I wrote to Mary Penrose, sorry, John Penrose, he's a wet house husband, who was the minister responsible, and I said, because I used to get asked on the doorstep, okay, smart Alec, it's Friday, we're out the EU, what's the crack? And the first time I went, well, that's a good question, I'll find out. Are you actually interested or are you just having a go at me? No, I'm interested, I'll come back. And I kind of went away and I worked out, I believe we should now have a Scottish, a Welsh, Northern Irish, and an English Parliament. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Because if those people go, I want an English Parliament, everyone goes, oh, here we go. Blooming places, look at them with their silly flag. No. The only way we will achieve it is subtly. And I believe then that we have an overarching Great Britain Parliament, which is loosely based on the unelected House of Lords type thing, whereby Scottish Parliament sends something to them. If they send it back three times, then all four parliaments have to debate it and reach compromise. On international affairs, there should be ministers responsible for dealing with that as an island group. That was my idea, because there is no doubt at this moment in time, are we bonkers? You know, we have no say virtually anywhere else, but the Scottish nationalists, all 50 of them, can come down and they have well, oh, stop Sunday opening, I think. But anyway, they have a say, and it's wrong. And I do believe that this kind of model, because, you know, it's evolution, not revolution. It's evolution, not Swiss revolution. Swiss or Belgium. Swiss or Belgium. But, we are, but we are countries. Wales, yeah. you know, Ireland, Scotland. We, we have a tradition of being countries unified as a united kingdom, Great Britain, whatever you want to call it. And I think we can continue down that road. The reins always have to be let out every so often. So yeah, I'm, I'm very pro that kind of federal approach. Yeah. We have to get an English Parliament. But sorry, can sorry, can I just push press you a bit more from a philosophical point of view? Do we need to be more of a, a, a status party, more in, in interventionist, appealing to, to, to working class communities? I think those things are up for debate because I think people are, and I've recently fallen prey to this, something I will say on a totally personal note to you. Anyone heard of a thing called the Court of Protection? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Justice Mumby described it as the most secretive and furtive court. I'll go further because my 90-year-old mum, who all she wants to do is be near her little baby, that's me, has been now criminalised. She has a doll's order, deprivation of liberty. She's not allowed out. She's not allowed to do anything, okay? Any of you in here should find, talk to your solicitor and get a thing called a LPA, Lasting Power of Attorney, you can get it for health and welfare, or for finance, 
and you can get it and just put it on the shelf in your solicitors, but if you do not do this, the state will have you. I have been privy to this. It's disgusting, it's outrageous, it's draconian, and you will be criminalised. So talk to people about this, it is important. I don't hold with total interventionist, Stalinist state, but I do hold with the fact, I think, that we as a party... Yeah, I think whomsoever wins our leadership election, day one, needs to go to the press and make the running, because if they do not do that, the press will go to them, and they will go to them on their terms. Okay? Um, sorry. Yeah, just to, um, thank you. Just to come back to the earlier point, the, the gentleman at uh, grammar school, so obviously being a, being a grammar school teacher myself here in Gloucestershire, where we're privileged to have seven grammar schools, yes. one of which is in the top ten in the country, uh, and I had the pleasure of attending myself. Um, which which was? Which was? It's Sir Thomas Richards. Um, obviously the grammar school system is, is it does, I would go one further on with you on this one and say actually the education system is one size fits all, it doesn't work, it doesn't appreciate the fact that every single human mind is different and needs to be treated as such. Um, as an economist and somebody who looks at biological systems as well, I'll tell you this, a system works where you have division of labour, people find out what they're good at, they specialise, they train, they get involved in that, and they build for it and so on. So that's why I see the education system going forward. And to meet your point, yeah, maybe in another time it wasn't how it should have been. No, it should have been purity of esteem. But that's what needs to change. And given that equity of esteem and having the technical quality. And build on those experiences that you had. I just want to get, I'll get to the point really quickly because I want to hear your answer on this. Richard if you're still going to sleep at the back, Richard, yeah, sorry. Richard, <laughs> Richard made the point about Britishness. Um, English well, Englishness, but the, yeah. like, it's a LinkedIn point. Um, I had the pleasure of citizenship to our young people in this county, and they have a very, very strong identity of what it means to be from this country, what attributes that stands for on the global stage, that of tolerance, that of being considered in your yeah. approach to things, that of being balanced, that of being open to people mm -hmm. until they do something to harm you, not prejudiced until they do something good for you. So those ideals are here in our young people. What will you get to go forward to tap into that and bring that to the fore? I went round, like I said to you, I used to make a point of going round to places that didn't like us. We opened a shop in Western Superbear, absolutely bang opposite the college. Oh, deep joy, they loved us. And they walked by, and at the end of it, because I've done okay, all right, I'm not rich enough to be a socialist or a Tory, but I've done okay. <laughs> I said to them, I, if I'm elected, I will not take the salary, okay? I said, I'm going to rip the arse out of the expenses of mine, because I'm going to do such a job for Western Supermen, I'm going to sit to the back teeth of this town in Westminster. But I will not take the salary, I will put it in the trust fund for the kids in Western, because there's no jobs. The MP's proudest boast was the improvements to the motorway junction. I said to him, yeah, to get people out. <laughs> and he didn't like that very much. I said, I want to get him in. And... At the end of that election, all these kids walking by abusing us, and I'd say, hey, come on, have a chat, you know, whatever. I got an email, and a young lad emailed me, and he said, five out of the eight people in my class who could vote voted for you. And that, that allied to the little old lady who came in and gave me 20 pounds, she wanted a country back, and the two high spots of that election, and I just couldn't believe it. And this country, on your point, World War II, the Americans came over here with the black Americans and the white Americans, yeah? We embraced them both. Eventually, it's a wonderful book written by Neville Shute, the checkerboard, we banned the Americans from apart, the whites, because of their treatment of people. This country is brilliant. So my, my grandfather died for that on the Somme in three feet of, sorry, 0.9 of a metre of mud. And my father was driven nuts on Lancasters. We are a great country, and cast your mind around the world. Has any other country ever integrated like us? You go to America, they're Irish American, Italian American, Black American, Hispanic American, and that is held up as the great melting pot. Look at us, we're Brits. It seems to work. When David Cameron called us quitters, I absolutely blew my stack. And I said in a public meeting, why don't he go to New Zealand and tell them they're a pathetic little pitiful island, they're a bunch of quitters, they need to be ruled from um, Canberra. There's a good place. That'd cheer them up. Why don't he go to Japan and tell them they're all a bunch of quitters, useless dummocks, and they need to be ruled from Shanghai. We are an island race, and I don't know what it means. I just don't know what it means. We are the archetypal moral race. 
There was a wonderful thing on Radio 4 the other day about genetics, and people said, oh, I'm Viking. And this bloke said, you're not. You're everything. We're everything. I now put myself down as mixed race, and the respect I get is also awesome. <laughs> Saxon. Hey. So, yeah, we are a bloody cool country. And don't ever forget yeah. it. And I go around the, the schools and the colleges engaging with people who've been brainwashed. Hartbury College, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm on a mission now. Hartbury College told the kids to vote Remain. Yeah. Lecturers. Sorry, sir. Oh, what's no, it's okay. It's <laughs> <That's laughs> <that's> his <laughs> fault. Uh, last thing, parent attorney for your, uh, for your Audi parents. Yeah. Just go down to solicitors, they'll charge you £600 for it, and it's done. But I did my own for nothing. For yeah, it cost you 110 quid. Yeah. yeah, you, you can put the registration fee, but it's not at all. Well, my mother, I've got other stuff to say. My, my, mother, my mother was absolute borderline, and what happened is the solicitor, a family solicitor, came and then demanded that the GP sign it off because I'd got the solicitor for the official solicitor demanding that the state had the money. I can't stress, however you do it. I'm sorry, I don't understand what this is all about. The last thing, parent attorney, is basically you've got your, your money, you've got your kids, your family, whatever. If you go a bit doolally, or if you, as my mother did, went into hospital, caught a urinary tract infection, which apparently sends you a bit funny anyway. She's always been wildly eccentric. She used to cycle around the village aged 90 in pink hot pants. <laughs> she wonders why I moved. Um, the gallops in our family. And, uh, thank you, before you say anything. And, of course, all of her eccentricities, in comes a social worker with her boxes going, ah, ooh, ah. Next thing, there's a doll's order, deprivation of liberty. And once the state get their hooks in you, she's a prisoner, my mother, I can think of a lot more people I'd like to slap a bloody doll's order on than my 90-year-old seven-stone mum. And I've been to court three times. It's agony. A lasting power of attorney for either finance or health and welfare preferably both, will enable <laughs> your children to be nice to them, because <laughs> they will choose your care home. Yeah. <laughs> but seriously, it is worth talking to someone. So this is good. It depends who you get. Ours is about 350 But you can do it yourself. You're obviously sane and compass, well, reasonably you're here, but, you know, <laughs> that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> oh, well. Sorry, yeah. Any, any yeah, other... Can, can I go on? Uh, about ground schools? Um, I, it's I, a hot subject, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But uh, I'll take some steam out of it, hopefully. <laughs> uh, I, went to, uh, I went to Science Centre Grammar School, and um, I wasn't particularly good, I wasn't a particularly good scholar, in as much as I didn't achieve much. But the one thing that Grammar School taught me was a trip to the cinema with our English teacher. Uh, great fun, great anticipation. And we went in and we saw Henry V with Lawrence Olivier. And um, no exaggeration to say that I looked at the screen and I thought, this guy is speaking English, but I've never heard it spoken like this before. And it was a whole new world open up to me. I then got Thomas Hardy's Under the Greenwood Tree the following day. That was my set book. And that set me off. Um, and I've had a, a great, hopefully, relationship with the English language. And it's one of the greatest things you can uh, achieve, one of the greatest gifts you can have if you use it properly. Um, grammar school is divisive. My last day, or a couple of days before I left, went in with the, uh, for the interview with the head, and I could, by that time I could read upside down. He had my papers in front of him. Right across the top was university potential, nil. Now, if people are talking about um, grammar schools and secondary schools, as they were then, being divisive, that was divisive for me. Calling them secondary was divisive. Uh, they should have yes, been called yeah. technology schools. I never give, I've not given that a great deal of thought, but firstly, the first day that I went to grammar school, um, the, the, the kids were talking about it. Bear in mind I was in the grammar school, not in the secondary. They were all saying, oh, there's a secondary school up the road. And I, I didn't realise, so I was going to school. I didn't even know. OK, so I've got the grammar school. Well, at least you're in Sirens, I was in Basildon. I might as well have had a target painted on me, Jackson. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was divisive in yeah. Basildon. And I'll take your point, but we should have learned from that. We should have learned that, basically, 
people, there's a key to everybody. I tried to learn the guitar. I was going to be Elvis Presley, so I knew he was going to keel over. And I tried for eight years to learn the guitar, and I could not learn the wretched guitar. And one day, a mate of mine said, hey, can I see this book? Really cool. So I went and saw this book. And he just sat there talking to me. And I said, yeah, yeah, whatever. I said, when are we going to do some stuff, like stuff? He said, no, I just want to know how your brain works. And he said to me, right, you think in shapes. He said, does anyone here play chess? Right, OK. There's two main chords. All you need, how do you think all those mongrels on top of the pops play the guitar? Give me a break. There's two shapes. There's the knight, which is one and two to the side, which is E. And there's A, which is the rook. And from those two chords, they slide them up and down. You get every single chord you want. And he explained that. I went, ah, all of this business, the actual dexterity, he said, you'll have to spend ages practicing, but I knew how it worked. That's how I learned. Other people learn differently. Other people learn parrot fashion. You remember our times tables? You can't teach one-on-one. -on -one. It's a real shame. But you can kind of group people, and you must allow flexibility. And we must, your point, we must learn the lessons from the past to provide. You know, this is what the past is meant to do. The future is a mixture of the present and the past. And we just disregard it because it's old-fashioned. It must be rubbish. It ain't. You know? So, is there any other um, questions? Yes, sir. I think having been part of this for years and years and years recently, there's quite a lot of people quite rightly saying, you know, what's the point of you getting done it? What do you think of that? I got asked that in Plymouth, funnily enough, and at the time, I've not given it a vast amount of thought, which I have now, with the limited resources available, and we are the opposition. Just, just look at it logically. A bunch of left-wing champagne socialists bleating on about they're not going to sing the national anthem and everything the government say they oppose. Everything the government do isn't bad. It probably needs debate from someone with half a brain. And our purpose now, and this is why I want whomsoever is elected as leader, day one, I want them to take it by the scruff of the neck and I want them to announce a deputy and I want them to announce a chairman that heal our party, okay? Because there is no doubt, and I ain't going to gloss over it, there's little rifts and divisions because trying to herd kippers is like trying to herd cats. It's like we are, I believe, that which encapsulates this funny little island. We're a total mix, and you tell a Brit what to do. Well, you could have found that out, didn't you, eh? You've got to do this, yeah, what right about we don't get told what to do. And somebody, Nigel did it by a force of personality and the fact that the bloke was just 20 years, 24-7, 365. Have you any concept? Why not? It's just, it's just, I mean, for God's sake. Someone's got to take that mantle on. Now, what the, the parallels between my own funny little company, you keep us come of age, okay? My little company, about four or five years ago, I stood at a board meeting and I said, guys, we've got to start behaving like a mini corporate. They went, this is board of directors, they went, okay, what's that? I said, I don't know. We've got to start behaving like one. We're no longer earn trading as. This is not Nige trading as anymore. We are a professional political party, which we sometimes railed against, you know. I stood there and said, look, I ain't a pro -pol. I'm not a professional politician, I'm just a bloke who believes in something, which is why I've got no script. I did that with somebody who was a Romaniac with their reams of paper and everything. I said, I have no script because I actually believe in what I'm about to say. <laughs> we have a great future, and I believe that person should, within a week, TV, okay, thank God it's been eradicated, but TV would drip feed every week, drip feed the press what he wanted them to know. There is no doubt he brought control of the media to a, a fine art, you know. And we need to do the same every week. Whosoever needs to have a pre press briefing. Right, this is my deputy, this is my chair, and while we're on the subject, the NEC, anyone got any opinions about that? Yeah. Yeah, okay, okay, chill. <laughs> I went on record as saying I believe it's something we pinch from the Labour Party. It's done them no favours. I don't think it's doing us real favours. What I would like to see is a national chairs executive. This is personal, by the way. Comprised of, you guys have your meetings, and you say to your chair, three of you say, you know, I think, I think this, I'm pretty, you know. So you have a vote on it. He goes to the county and says, look, my people are saying this. That's funny, mine are. That's funny, mine are. They go to region. They go to national. 
And then national debate on it, and it comes back down. It is, we are a party of the people, for the people, let's start behaving like one before we start being taken over yeah, by the propos. Yeah. And I won't have it. People who are just professional politicians, <coughs> there is a place for them, you know, because I think some of us in here are probably a bit reactive, and I've done it before, you know. I engage brain, don't open mouth, and yeah, you know, usual thing. But there is a place for them. You know, the, the people who, I did it two weeks ago, I skillfully avoided answering any of the questions on a regular interview, but you, you do learn it eventually. Um, so that's what I feel, the National Chairs Exec, the, the voice of our members goes up and it comes back down. That's a personal view and that's what I'll be pressing for and I feel that we can drip cabinet, shadow cabinet, you, you asked about the purpose of UKIP. What greater slap in the face for the Labour Party to say, look, with the greatest respect, you're a joke. This is the best you can come up with. Don't sing the national anthem and we want everyone to be on the minimum wage. Brilliant. Marvellous. What we want is we want, boom, 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 and appoint a shadow cabinet. <coughs> Take the press by the scruff of the neck and do it on a weekly basis, weekly press briefing, and please, 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 whoever you support in the leadership competition, I beg that they put together a team that draws from all our areas, okay? and will appeal to everybody, because it is a team. Okay, we have been Nige trading as. We ain't got a Nigel. And if the establishment have got half a brain, they'll put him in the House of Lords before he gets himself elected and causes bloody havoc. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll listen. Yes? One of the guys in charge of uh, Stephen Wolfe's... Um, sort of Stephen who? Stephen Wolfe. That's no business. <laughs> And he, I don't know if you've seen this, but he has been circulating a model of an ex-NEC, a new NEC. And it pretty much um, echoes what you've been saying this evening. Well, I'm glad about that because I wrote to uh, Blimey, Steve Crowley, do you remember him? Oh, I like Steve, he's a, yeah, he's a good lad. He's a good lad and he stuck it out through thick and thin. And I dug the email out. In 2011, I wrote to him suggesting things like this. Okay. I wrote to um, the Tories about this federal-style Great Britain, which was, was, was gleaned from talking to people on the doorstep, what they wanted, you know. We want an English Parliament. And I think if we go flat out for it, it will cause havoc, but if it becomes part of an attached system, we'll get it. Uh, there's a lot of ways of doing things, and sometimes you've got to be subtle, which is an anathema to me. You um, has, do you feel that UKIP has the uh, potential to, ally to what you were saying earlier, engage a policy forum kind of uh, idea where, say, a white paper would come from, from national uh, about a particular issue that was pertinent or topical, would they get set down before a chair to then have that conversation with people to then gain the response and send the feedback? We are in a not only going up, but also, well, what do the people think? Can you go and ask your people? We are in the age of communication. God's sake, let's embrace it. You, know, yeah, you yeah, can yeah. communicate, like I said to you, these people in the city of London, you can communicate like that. What what you can needs, and again, I said this after the 2015 election, it went down like a absolute lead balloon. The whole party wants a complete business audit, and it wants an O&M audit. And the time has come for channels to be established, because you can't have people going off, blasting on Twitter. You have to have, we have to speak now. We have to have debate in our meetings. I'm not saying we become secretive. You have to have open debate and discussion, but then you reach consensus. Sometimes, cracking lad, well lad, everyone's a lad to me, Sam Gould in Wales. I never warned to Sam. Didn't warn to him. And he's the RO for Wales, and he's young, he's quite thrusting, etc., etc. And I went over there to offer my services as an assembly member, and I got through to the hustings. He didn't. This is a guy who stood as PPC in Cardiff. He stood as their RO. He is their RO. Great organiser. And he was gutted. Can you imagine what he felt like? They didn't even let him through to the hustings. And he took it on the chin, and he shut up, and he got on with his job. Because 
And I tell you what, I take my hat off to him. And that's what people in UKIP are about. Not the minute they get a knockback blathering off to the press, tweeting yeah. out, or I'm a bit upset, or what was the latest one? UKIP's on a great spiral, and I'm a drama queen, I think. Yeah. Yeah. We no. about the same person. I couldn't yeah. possibly comment. Um, but I'm sorry, sorry about her. She was one of ours years ago. No, Steve Wolf, I'm talking oh, about. Oh, we're Alex Phillips, we are. Oh, they're, they're, they're out there, and we've attracted them because we've had this desperate race from Robert Orange Kilroy Silk to embrace every tiny bit of celebrity that comes our way, and they've realised we've been done up like a kipper. <laughs> um, we are the Neil Hamilton. Yeah. No comment. Moving swiftly on. Uh, I, yeah, well, get polls. I, I, yeah. I think, I think there is, there, there, sorry, Alex, go for it. Well, precisely what is happening is that we have had a candidate everybody thought was going to be great, and he's a scouser, he had a shower once last year, I believe, um, but effectively, he's now got all the divisive candidates on his side. Neil he, Hamilton's come out for him. Uh, Hamilton, Tim has come out for him. Tim, the Hamiltons have come out for him, one has to... They are um, incredibly skilled politicians, so one wonders why they've shown, why they've shown their hand. It's, it's one way of looking at it. The Welsh are very sceptical, because I've been speaking to the Welsh, and they really are not that over-enamoured. There's an awful lot of people in this party of Paris. Okay? Yeah. Um, we have to bring everyone together. If we say, Mr Nuttall isn't. The fact that he actually supported Lisa Duffy in the last one, and effectively, he's quite happy to. You stood, stood in that meeting with Suzanne Evans. She's got the, one of the biggest divisive characters in this organisation going. She is, and this though. They should marry each other. Yeah. Well, she's already married. Maybe it was a big deal. I think, to be honest, that's why I said whomsoever is elected needs to move very quickly to appoint people around him to unite the party. Right. And I think when you look at the more um, our um, unwashed scouser, I suppose, as to quote your words, is a unity candidate. There is very few people who've got anything actually dreadful to say about him. Everyone has opinions about most of the other candidates. Um, I myself support him. I make no bones about it, so I'm going to say that. It's still not on his website, but he, he supports the privatisation of certain areas of the National Health Service. What the hell is that going to do to us in the Labour Party? Yeah. That, that is interesting because, again, I decided I'd go and speak at a unionism, unionism meeting. <laughs> That's fun. And the Liberal Democrat said that. You have to accept that private companies have to make a profit. They did all but throw chairs at him. Um, I believe, because I was a child of the sort of 60s, 70s, I don't understand about paying for health or teeth or I don't get it. I really don't get it. I, you know, I pay I cause to be paid hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of national insurance every year. And why should why should I pay? I don't get it. Education, why should I pay? And in fact, at that university thing, the Tory said, Oh well, so you'd have um people subsidising the intellectual elite to get a, a degree. I said, that's rich coming from you. I said, possibly people investing. I said, you can't send 99% of us to university. Give me a break. And I feel what we should have again, business industry goes to the government and says, look, for God's sake, we are short with carers, doctors, digger workers, electricians, yeah. brain surgeons, yeah. blah, blah, blah. So the first thing, the first thing the government do is they go to Dover and they put a list on the wall. And you rock up and they say, hey, nice to meet you, how are you doing? Um, what, what do you do? Oh, you're a doctor. Oh, cool, right. And your wife, care worker, yeah, that's fine. Do you like the thought of being British and all that kind of stuff? Fab. Have a nice day. Next. Well, I'll do the <coughs> next, okay. Anyway. They then, in medium term, go to the universities and say, look, these courses will be grant aided. Mm. If you want to do Absolutely. a degree in David Beckham, yeah. not a problem, okay. you can have the status quo, nine grand a year tuition fees. You can do it, nothing will change. Yeah. But the country, we've got massive, scale. I can't recruit, I can't recruit in our industry, it makes me cry. Just can't. And what do you do? The skill sets are not there. A lot of the youth do not want to do a day's work. They don't have to do a day's work, basically. You know, they're pretty well off. So, I do think that. But going back to your question, Alex, I think basically that whomsoever is elected needs to move 
quickly and positively and not dither, which I think was Diane's downfall, because if you don't go to the press, they will sure as hell come knocking on your door. Right. Right, right. Yeah. Coming back to that point, do you know, um, what's your view on the idea if, if a kind of Lincoln style, I mean, uh, Abraham Lincoln in there is, is, yeah, in this, uh, is thinking to get people that are actually, you know, quite public opponents of his, actually at the table to one, make sure that they Around the table, but two, make sure that they have his ideas, his policies account, and have genuine. Faith. It's something I've often said about because we've all got elephants in the room. Carswell, Suzanne Evans been mentioned, blah blah blah. These people, I, I almost toy with the idea of saying to, to Douglas Carswell, uh, either put up or shut up. Either, you know, this is what we want from you, please. This is the party whip. I mean, it's not unreasonable, is it? You don't do as the Labour Party tell you. You get short thing actually, but you said the democratic. I think <laughs> whomsoever is elected, be it um, Paul, Rashid, I don't think there are any other names in the frame, needs to sit down with these people privately for an hour and say, right, on a one-to-one, -one, what am I allowed to say, person-to-person -person conversation, okay, and then we're going to go forward. We will go forward, and we need to be big enough to embrace, because look at what has happened to the Tory party, tore itself apart. Instead of working within to um, unify the Tory party, it ripped itself apart. It's ripping itself apart on a ruddy runway now. Give me a break. Um, we need to heal ourselves a little bit. We need to unify, and if that means people go, then they go, because sometimes you've got to bite the bullet and you've got to cut it out. Do you think the party is robust enough? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I do, because no, I was asked... I was asked with a gang of four there, they're going to be causing trouble all the way through. Yeah. Carswell, Flynn, or whatever his name is, and Susanna Evans, and Hamilton. And Hamilton. 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 Yeah, yeah, the gang of four with the name. Yeah. This party will not achieve yeah. anything yeah. with the time that they're at. Sort of we, are, we are a political party. We should seek a political solution rather than a bloodbath. But they brand ourselves. There comes a time. You tried to kick Nigel into the wrong grass earlier on with a couple of your remarks, saying that we're now like a corporation, we're like a business without Nigel. All right? I don't think we can go anywhere at this point in time. No, that is misunderstood because Nigel, Nigel, basically now should, I believe, be made president of the party. I've been saying it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not what he was saying. He's saying, he's saying, he's saying yeah. Yeah. yeah, if he yeah. gets elected, he will make him, and I will be president. Yeah. Because yeah. what we must do is never lose sight of got us, what got us where we are. Yeah. And he what did. got us where we are, single-handedly, probably yeah. for about four or five years, was Nigel. Yeah. yeah. There's not an orator like him. Cast your mind back to the thing with Clegg, okay? Clegg. Right. Considered one of the greatest parliamentarians, greatest European, married to a Spaniard, his kids are called Carlos, Manuel and Alberto, yeah? He could not be more European. He was destroyed by right. just a bloke. Yeah. Just a bloke telling the truth. Nigel has got us where we have got. Like my board haven't binned me, but I now am responsible for things like strategy. Nigel needs to be a president of the party. He still needs input. We're all flawed. Yeah. He ain't perfect. Suzanne Evans ain't perfect. Rashid ain't perfect. No one's perfect. If they were, it'd be a really simple world. We have to retain all of the support groups within the party. And I think it can be done. It can be done. But, like you say, in Western, I got known as the chief omelet maker. Don't you, know, don't you think that uh, the, the likes of Carl's have gone too far in the way that they degraded the party and everything that they've done and said? John Penrose said to me, the only thing he said to me of note in the Western Super General Election was Douglas stands for Douglas. Mm -hmm. yeah. The only thing he said of note, everything else was dribble. And I think there's, and I firmly believe we have a party whip, and that party whip should be brought to bear. And there should, there should be, we've got a great, listen, we've got a great opportunity. There's an old saying in business, no such thing as a problem, only an opportunity. And basically, we have an opportunity to get a clean sheet of paper on the desk, okay, and write sensible things on it, or rip it up and write drivel. And we need to talk to these people, they represent, I mean, we are a broad church. We are a broad church. We're bringing together Colonel Blute, retired from Worthing, 
and we're bringing together Red Robo, basically. We are the broadest political party. All right? Now, I would think, is he going to chuck me off the stage or are you going to yes, do the yeah, um, yeah, I'd have thought so. Yeah. One more, one more. Well, uh, is there anyone who has not asked a question? Just two, two, two questions if we can. There's Mike here and there's Roger there. And perhaps he's chucked only three. We'll be, be quick because only we'll be in the bar afterwards, won't you? So people can come yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll do about now. But no, please, so there's and what well, Nigel has achieved and the fact that that bloke came and spoke in the Forest of Dean. He came and spoke over in the forest and I watched him take apart some troublemakers that were there. Okay, then will, you will not see an orator outside. <laughs> you. I do you say it's a very difficult act for anybody to this, follow. This is a oh, very, very odd question now because you keep hearing at the moment that the um, EU wants to insist on having these talks now, possibly in French, because the bloke they decided to have the, the talks, the extra talks, would be French. Now, it raises me an alarm though because I keep saying, hang on a minute. Don't you read your own paperwork? Because everything that's done in the EU, the only legal binding text form is English. It is the European language. Like it or lump it, Monsieur Hollande. <laughs> it is. I'm afraid you want to go anywhere, you want to fly a plane, you want to drive a ship, you speak English. English. <laughs> that's what I mean. I mean, does the EU, or does the paper actually pay attention to the fact that any legal document in Brussels that goes to court has to be presented in English and only the English text form is legally binding? So why do they keep ranting about it? But Oh, the talks have to be held in French. That is all indeed. That is all indeed. It's posturing. Yeah, I think it's posturing because I think, yeah. you know, before you go to Muhammad Ali used to do this, didn't they? <laughs> well, he did. He did. Yeah. He destroyed him psychologically before he got to the ring. And I think there's a great deal of posturing going on. Um, and I think it is our job to make sure that Theresa May doesn't get her extra runway so she can get even more people in the country. It's our job to make damn sure she does what the people wanted and forget all this rubbish about, oh no, it's Parliament's will, it's the will of the people, that's democracy, you know. It ain't perfect, like the man said, it just happens to be better than the other options. Quite frankly, I don't trust Mrs. Smith. I've been, possibly not, I've been in and out of UK for 15 years and um, we shouldn't beat ourselves up about what is happening in the leadership because it's been ever thus. Um, talking about, um, and it usually resolves itself, as you... It will in about yeah. a month and a half's time. Hopefully, yeah. Talking about policy papers, etc. Ten years ago, as a result of a meeting on the internet, uh, about a dozen of us formed a group to write policy papers. Uh, we never informed the party because it was something that we were doing at the weekends to see how it went. And we began meeting in uh, Let's Late. We became known as the Let's Late group. We had a two lords from the House of Lords come down and they joined in. But as soon as the party heard about it, they thought that we were taking them over. They banned us from conference and I got, and everyone else did, we got accused of being traitors, for God's sake. <laughs> traitors because we were writing policy papers. The, 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 the leadership has got to understand that there are people in this party who are quite fantastic with what they know, what they can do, and they can raise this party a million miles above. Uh, the, uh, that is rights. why I want this national chair's executive, because when I stood in Bath, there's a guy in Bath, Charles Pilton, he's an absolute, yeah, he's an absolute genius at demographics and yeah. stuff like that. We've got skill sets in this party that are being wasted. So I stood in yeah, regional absolutely. meetings, I used to turn up to these regional meetings and get shouted down and say, for God's sake, can't we just have policy groups as a well, skills groups, skill sets. And it doesn't matter about geography, we've all got an internet connection of some description. Yeah, you know, there are people, Dan Evans, another one in Bath, he's yeah. young, he's the future. Right. Um, we've got some amazing people in this party, you know, let's harness them and let's stop petty fears, petty yeah. politics yeah, getting yeah, yeah. in the way. And that is why I will fight for this national chair's exec so that your views can be put to the relevant uh, yeah. branch that you attend. Everyone votes on it. If I say, actually, we think you're talking about pants, you'll have yeah. to accept it because we're democratic. Absolutely. But if they say, we like this, no, we want you to go to the county meeting and we want you to put it on the agenda. Right. And up it goes. And that's why I believe that will be such a democratic way of doing things. And now's a great time to do it. We've got an open blank piece of paper. 
let us grab the opportunity and not mess it up, please. And throw our weight behind whomsoever, because you hear all sorts of comments, oh my God, if I get elected, I'll kill myself. Don't. Don't. We, we make the party, not the glitterati, us. Yeah, yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah. The, the media said the other day that last time the banks went bust, it cost you, you and I £1.8 trillion pounds to bail them out. When they go bust and the property bubble bursts, which will be in the next few years or whatever, <coughs> who bails them out? What's UKIP's policy? Uh, what's their policy on all of us getting absolutely ridiculous rates of interest on our savings? The problem is that I, I'm not an economist with my 1-0 level, but what I do know is whether you're a family, whether you're a village, a town, a city, a county or a country, you've got to make something and flog it. You cannot survive flogging each other financial services and bloody pizzas. I'm sorry, I don't get it. We have to go back to a structured education system a university system. Yeah, like, listen, I've got no problem with nicking their ideas. Absolutely. Because, for God's sake, why can't we pinch the best of the ideas and, and, and put them into the melting pot? Because we are. There has never been a Hitler in this country. Okay? There's never been a Kaiser Pill. Because, like I said earlier, it's like herding cats. You can't tell us what to do. Okay? We will fall behind a principle if we want to. And the Germans are different to us. We're not European. I don't know why. Please don't ask me why. We're an island race and we're potty. Okay? That's what we are. But that's what makes us great, Britain. And it does. And we think out of the triangle. Who split the atom? Rutherford, 1936. I get a Frenchman come up to me and says, You can't even build a power station, monsieur. We will build you a Chernobyl Mark II. Oh, you. You're so stupid. I said, oh, cheers, pal. He said, you split the atom. We design the technology. We also have a thing called fast breeder. Anyone, you know, size will be, brag yeah. A byproduct of fast breeder is hydrogen. Commercially produced hydrogen. Fuel of the future. We can't build them now. We're too thick. Microwaves. Anyone ever heard of the Gaia theory? Basically, the world is a huge self-correcting mechanism. And if it gets a bit of an imbalance, dinosaurs, a bit of a comet, too many farting, they're all gone, dead, okay? They can't exist on 26% oxygen, okay? And it's the, the Earth sorts itself out. Gaia was a scientist, and in 1950, he was conducting experiments on cryogenic freezing of hamsters and bringing them back to life by heating up red-hot teaspoons, scraping them over their chest. And they just, he said, it was dreadful. They just kept burning and blowing up. It was awful. And he got to hear about another chap who was doing experiments around the radar stations. He kept finding cooked birds. You know this is going, don't you? Yeah. And they got a thing called a particle accelerator. It arrived on three articulated lorries. They signed the official secret act, and they tried to revive frozen hamsters with it. It was as long as this room, and there's a little box on the door. And they go. He said, in India, we gave up. We used to just put our pasties in here. It was brilliant, you know. And 25 years later, these little boxes arrived from Japan. We have to get the whole process. Not just inventing the stuff. Yeah. I've got a Scotch, I've got a Scotch technical director. He's not Scots, he's Scotch. He is Scottish man. He even wears a frock. <laughs> anyway, he has got a tea towel up in his office. The Scots invented, they invented electricity. They didn't discover it. They invented it according to him. They invented everything. The Welsh dug it up, coal, iron. We cobbled it together and flogged it. Nation of shopkeepers. You know, we're a little team, Great Britain. We're a little team, and believe you, we've rocketed past the French, and if I had my way, I would say to everybody, I want you to get in work 10 minutes earlier, leave 10 minutes later, because we can put the Germans in our sights. We're a brilliant economy if we get our finger out. You know? But listen, thanks guys for having to put up with me rant on it. It's absolutely brilliant, and he said you're an active branch, and thanks for coming over from the forest and from Cheltenham. Um, and, and hopefully, it's, you know, we've stayed away. That's a start. Big round of applause. Yeah.
to Ernie quite a lot these days, and when I'm a bit down, whenever I speak to Ernie, I feel much more uplifted and more confident about the future, very optimistic. Yes, we've got challenges and problems, but we've got opportunities as well. Well, in fact, um, I bounce off him. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing I will say, which is here, and um, Wolfie's here tonight, there's the, 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 the lots of things I'd like to say, but it's gone too long, but one thing I would say is go, go where you're not wanted or not liked. Now, I arranged, to meet, I arranged to meet Richard at Shire Hall about a month ago to give him some uh, leaflets. And, and he said, oh, come and listen. And I sat at the back of the council debating chamber, one new kid member in the entire Shire Hall, which is Richard. I could not have been more shocked or disgusted. I, I couldn't believe it. Some bloody Lib Dem woman from Cheltenham who, when, when Richard starts speaking, got her fingers in her ears. Um, the, Labour lady, the Labour lady from Stonehouse near Stroud started chattering away and squealing. And a young Lib Dem guy from the Cotswolds wouldn't even call him by his name. The UKIP member, you're the UKIP member, you don't have any thought. <laughs> they do not like this man there. <clears throat> There's another meeting, I think, in December. Yeah. Can we all go and support Richard? I'll, we'll email the dates because yeah, he had no support. It's, yeah. worth, it's worth the admission price. We can yeah. <laughs> he, he had the motion on, he had the motion on, on, on grammar schools. The Tories wanted to support him, I could tell, because I know some. They filibustered it, so it didn't have to be spoken about or debated, and they could kick it into the long grass for uh, three months. So it's coming up again in December, I think. And the leader of the council, his sidekick, he was a police and crime commissioner candidate, also from the forest, but like smirking back to schoolboys whenever he spoke. So he's got the Conservatives against him, he's got the Liberal Democrats against him, he's got the Labour Party against him. You've got to be doing something right, mate. <laughs> Here, who I've got to know quite well over the last month, who's standing for us in Long Levens, best candidate we've had yeah. for a long, well, one of the best candidates, but best candidate by election. He's working bloody hard and he's making a real change. And, and the proof of that is the reaction of the other parties. Labour, Liberal, and Conservative will not debate him in a public meeting. He has to have all these over three empty chairs. Um, <laughs> and, we've, that, and we've got the Conservative leader of the council today, of Gloucester City Council, who also represents that same ward, responding on Facebook. So they've been bubbling away, biting their lip, biting their lip, biting their lip, and the down burst. Yeah. Um, and then we, we had outside the car on Levens, the Lib Dem leader of Gloucester City Council and Gloucestershire County Council, came up ranting, wasting all his time on a weekend when two girls were stabbed in on Levens. A young man had his brain that knocked out in Cheltenham. Um, a man was killed in Gloucester and a shop was raided in Stonehouse. Now, and he's the Lib Dem leader of the council. So we're doing something right from small acorns, big oaks do grow. Ernie's only in Hereford. I'd love to see him back in Gloucester. You're always welcome here, and I'm sure in Cheltenham before it's like, yeah, and elsewhere in Gloucestershire. Please come back to Gloucester and Gloucestershire. Come and speak to us again. Brilliant, mate. Thank you very much. Thanks. I just thought probably people want to drink, so Ernie, I'll be in the bar, I'm sure. Any other questions, I'm sure you're happy to speak yeah, yeah, yeah. Answer in the bar.